All right. Speaking with Senate candidate Sheriff Mark Lamb from Pinal County. Uh, Mark, I appreciate this. Thank you for having me on, Mike. I appreciate it as always. Um, I know that there's been a lot going on nationally, but this race is it could quite well decide the balance of the Senate, who has control of the Senate. In these final days of the campaign, what is the message you're taking to voters in Arizona in this primary? You know, look, the one thing that we've had success with, Mike, is our message has stayed the same. That's what the voters want. I think they're tired of, of politics where the message changes based on where you go. So our message has been consistent the whole way along. Arizona needs a proven conservative leader and fighter. We need somebody with the right experience to deal with the border issue, which is the number one issue in this country, which also happens to be the number one national security threat to Americans. We also have the economy. You know, look, I've balanced a large budget. I've stayed within that budget. And then also crime is on the rise. And we've got a myriad of other things. And what people are looking for is a consistent message and somebody who represents their values of God, family, freedom in this country and the Constitution. And also that that has proven to them who they are and what they will stand for. When it comes to the border issue, we spoke to the Cochise County Sheriff recently about the numbers being down. Was it 29 percent or whatever the number was in June? And he said he wasn't feeling that in his county, that he seemed it seemed to be kind of a numbers game. Are you seeing a difference in Pinal County in the number of crossers and inter interactions with people in the country illegally? So one of the things that we experience in the, the Tucson sector, which is Pinal County, Pima County, Santa Cruz County, Cochise County, is we have the most gotaways through here, especially Cochise and coming up through Pima into Pinal County. We're on the Indian Reservation, we see a lot of it. So what we feel and see is very different than what they feel and see. We're seeing 250 to 500 uh, 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 gotaways a day. Plus those numbers, while they may have gone down, that's probably more due to the weather, the summer, which is typically when these numbers dip a little bit. So I think they were playing with the numbers. When Biden announced this, he knew we were going to be entering it into these summer months. It went basically from about 7,500 a week in the Tucson sector down to about 5,000 a week in the Tucson sector. 5,000 is still a lot of people to deal with every week. And so, yeah, we're still filling it uh, every day I, down in, in, in Pinal and down in Cochise. We're still feeling the effects of it. So while the numbers may be down, I think because of the gotaways, which is usually who we deal with, we're still feeling it. You know, um, we talk about the heat all the time, and I know you deal with it here in, in Phoenix, where I am. Uh, we've changed the rules in the city of Phoenix. They closed down the hiking trails in the hottest parts of the day because hikers are getting overwhelmed and it protects them from themselves. But it's also to protect first responders that have to do these rescue missions. Can you talk about what that's like to inter intercede when you have people in crisis that are dying from this extreme heat? How real is that problem? How big is that problem? It's huge. We have about 300 calls for search and rescue a year. A lot of them are in the summer, whether it's the superstitions, Picacho. We've got several hunt, uh, hiking areas, not to mention the illegals. When people call 911 out in the desert that the cartels have left for, for dead or left behind because it was so hot, those people, when that 911 call comes in, it comes into Border Patrol, and our helicopter is usually the ones that's dispa dispatched to those locations. But just to give you one anecdotal story to that, a couple of years ago, we had a bunch of hikers who were seasoned hikers come from, I think, Iowa or somewhere back there. They wanted to hike flat iron superstition at like two in the afternoon. And the person that was in charge there said, don't do this. This is a bad idea. They went up. Guess what? We had to rescue all 21 of them with our helicopter. So this is not the time to mess around. That heat is real. And uh, please, if you're going to be hiking, be a responsible hiker and do it at times. Uh, that is not going to likely kill you. Let's talk. I, I know we're talking about the campaign here, but all of this plays a role in that. But you're a life experience, and I've learned a lot more about you in the last few years. Your life experience in living all over the world and doing your mission in a part of the world where Spanish was necessary. How much does it help you in the campaign and in your career to be fluent in Spanish and being able to interact and communicate? Well, I've, in the in the campaign, it's huge. Uh, the, about 40 percent of the population of Arizona are of Hispanic Latin descent. And right now, when you talk about voters, 42 percent, according to Univision, 42 percent of, of Lat Latino vote 
is undecided right now. So being able to connect with these families and say, look, I want to represent all Arizonans. I want to make sure that all of our needs are being met. And I think it's important to balance law enforcement and immigration and border security. And being able to speak that language really helps me tra traverse all of those, the fears that some of these folks might have, when in the end I realized, look, this is just a guy who loves God, family, freedom, and he wants to do the best he can to protect me and my family and my community. And so that's been huge. And in my career, you know, when we go pull traffic stops and I'll be out on the I-10 tomorrow working again, pulling traffic stops, looking for smugglers, they can't get away with stuff when I, when I start speaking fluent Spanish with them. And also it makes them feel a lot more comfortable because they're going through a very traumatic and tr and, and really something that, you know, they just paid the cartels. They just traversed the cartels. Now all of a sudden they're sitting in front of law enforcement. That's a stressful situation. Let's talk about one area that I, have, I don't think we've really discussed, and that is how we reduce the deficits. If you go to the United States Senate, I just read a story today that uh, Social Security is not as valuable as it used to be, that inflation has really dropped it to a point where people can't be sustained. But also the program itself within 10 years is going to be so out of money that they're going to have to have a mandatory 20 percent cut in benefits. When you see these kinds of things happen, what are the plans you have to try to do in the United States Senate to reduce our deficit and to start getting our balance, our, our budgets balanced? Well, look, we spend money and our government, we send money all over the world as if we're flush with cash. But it's at the expense of the American people, whether it's through Social Security, which they're not raising Social Security payments, even though these people had a contract with the American government. They paid in their whole entire lives only to have the government give them a pittance of what they would have got somewhere else. We owe it to the American people to secure Social Security because that is the future for a lot of people. We've got the VA benefits. I just saw an article where now they're talking about because of all the economy, because of all the money they've sent to other places, especially Ukraine, now we're talking about reducing the payments to the veterans that, pay, that actually went and served this country. Completely unacceptable. So how we fix that? First of all, fixing the economy starts with getting our energy independence back. And then what we've got to do is we've got to eliminate parts of government that are not useful to the American people. And we should be taking and preserving the money for those contracts that we have with people like Social Security, VA benefits, Medicare. That's what we should be making sure is, is solvent. And I hope to do that. And the reason why I bring that experience of having managed a balanced budget with variable costs every year, and I stay within that budget. That's why this experience and having been in some government fashion, understanding how government works is extremely valuable, not just to Senate, but to the people of Arizona for the representative that they send back to represent them in D.C. So this leads me to kind of a personal question. Uh, the thought now of this campaign and the next chapter of your life, what is it going to be like for you? Have you thought about life without you being in law enforcement, as big of a part of your life as it's been? Have you considered that? What is it going to be like for you to be out of law enforcement? Mike, I'm probably one of the best questions I've had. Yes, I've unfortunately thought about it, but I don't like to dwell on it because it is going to be a huge impact in my life. I've been carrying a gun and a badge and protecting our communities for nearly two decades. I've been the sheriff for the last eight years. And overnight on December 31st, I go back to being with, you know, I'm a regular citizen, which has power in this country, but also I lose, you know, I'm, I'm walking away from that brotherhood. I'm walking away from a career that I love. I'm walking away from one of the most important pieces of America, which is justice and the rule of law. And so that's going to be tough. And uh, I try not to dwell on it because there's been some real surreal moments in my career recently where I went through my last memorial, my last posse graduation. This uh, next, in a couple of weeks, I will be going through my last cadet graduation. These are all things that I'm, I feel it when I go there. And I can only imagine I'm going to feel it a lot more when I'm no longer in it. But uh, let's hope that I'm taking my service to another level in Washington, D.C. as the U.S. Senator for Arizona. So I want to get your perspective in local law enforcement. I've talked to federal law enforcement officials, former FBI agents, Secret Service members, about the attempted assassination of the former president. And it seems like 
local law enforcement is kind of holding the bag here and pushing back and saying, listen, we were doing traffic detail, but you're in law enforcement. What you saw, can you give us from your perspective what you saw as the shortcoming that day? What were the things that you think should have been done different? And what went through your mind when you watched that happen? Well, look, I never liked armchair quarterback, Mike. You know that. So I'm going to speak in terms of what we went through because we actually had one of President Trump's rallies in Florence, in our county, at Country Thunder, where we, the sheriff's office, were responsible. Here were some of the challenges we had. They come with a very lean contingency of Secret Service agents. So we're actually having to supply people in suits. We're supplying people in uniforms. We're supplying some of our SWAT guys, our snipers, to help with the cat guys. I think they only had two or three cat guys there. So they had a very small contingency that we had to actually add a lot of resources to. Communication is one of the big problems. But down in Pinal County and, and where Country Thunder is, there's mountains all over the place and buildings. I don't know how they did not secure that roof. And Secret Service is the one that typically lays out the, the game plan for how we're going to protect that venue. And then we add into it. And so I can't see them. I, this is typical U.S. government, blame local guys. But this was really their operation. We're there to support their operation. And uh, there was a lot of problems with that. But I think like every American, I cannot understand how that roof was not covered by snipers because that was a major vulnerability. Sheriff, it's always good to catch up with you. I wish you the best of luck in this primary. And I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Mike, and God bless everybody, and God bless Arizona. Make sure you get out and vote July 30th for the primary. Please get out and vote. We need your vote. He said it best.